Good morning and welcome to Fellowship Bible Church. As Pastor Chris continues on in his sermon series in Acts 14, he's going to be talking about never giving up. And he has a wonderful exhortation for us to remember that no matter what comes our way, no matter how difficult the trials and even the temptations are, we have a God that strengthens us and enables us to make it through. And I'd like to turn your attention to a passage in Psalm chapter 73, verse 26. And it says, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And as the psalmist so beautifully states, he just mentions that even though our own strength might fail, even though our bodily function shut down and we feel like we just cannot go on, we have strength in the Lord. That God himself is our portion forever. And he's the one that gives us breath. He is the one that makes every heart, every beat of our heart beat as well. And so as we come before him, no matter what you're facing, difficulties, trials, tribulations, know that none of that is greater than the God whom we worship. He can provide us strength. He can provide us purpose. He can help us just to move one, fo- one step forward. And so we look to him to be our, our source of hope, our source of strength and inspiration as well. And our songs today point us upward towards the Lord as well. That even while everything else around us fails, when our very bodies betray us, God himself is there to lift us up. So let's consider that as we open this time in prayer and worship together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come before you. It's our privilege to lift up our praises to you. And even when we feel like we're exhausted from all that is going on in our life, we know that you're there to to pick us up and to even carry us as needed. Thank you for being our source of strength, for giving us songs to sing, and for allowing us to praise you. And so, Father, may you be honored and glorified this morning as we lift up our, our praises. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. You are not a God created by human hands. You are not a God dependent on any mortal man. You are not a God in need of anything we can give by your plan. That's just the way it is. You are not a God created by human hands. You are not a God dependent on any mortal man. You are not a God in need of anything we can give by your plan. That's just the way it is. From before time began, you were on your throne, you were God above, and right now, in the good times and bad, you are on your throne, you are God above, you're the only God who's power. You're the only God whose name and praise will never end. You're the only God who's worthy of everything we can give. You are God, that's just the way it is. You are God alone from before time began. On your throne, you are God of love, and right now, in the good times and bad, you are on your throne, you are God 
Child of God, you're unchangeable. You're unshakable. You're unstoppable. That's what you are. You're unchangeable. You're unshakable. You're unstoppable. That's what you are. You are God of love. Let me for a time begin. You were on your throne. You were God of love. And right now, in the good times and bad, you are on your throne. You are God of love. You are God of love. But before time began, you were on your throne. You are God of love. And right now, in the good times and bad, you are on your throne. You are God of love. You're unchangeable, you're unshakable, you're unstoppable, that's what you are. chapter 13 verses 44 through 46 it says this the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field when a man found it he hid it again and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field again the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls 
When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. You're my strength. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in God, we thank you that we can come before you to offer up our praises. And it's nothing they'll compare to the sacrifice which Christ paid on our behalf on the cross. We know that we are forgiven, and with that, we are grateful. And so may we live a life that is worthy of the calling with which we've been called, that we might pursue you, and that we might savior Jesus Christ, to enjoy him and to appreciate him and all that he has done. We thank you. In his name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Pastor Chris. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to FBC. Once again, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm the, I'm the new face on the block. My name is Pastor Chris. Uh, if I didn't get this chance to say hi or grab a meal or a, or a boba or something, I promise I'm making my round. I'm making my rounds. Um, thank God that, uh, you know, currently I'm, I'm here. I'm able to preach. As some of you may know, our, uh, our two head honchos, our bosses, the captains, have had COVID or are still having COVID. But thank God that, you know, I, I got a text this morning from uh, Pastor Steve. I finally tested negative. Cool. What are you going to do? I'm heading to the retreat for the last session. Lord of mercy. I cannot keep up with these, <laughs> our captains here. 
uh, I was telling some people, some of my friends, I'm like, I'm getting outrun by like 60 year old. I'm exhausted. I am exhausted. Who would have thought, right? <clears throat> well, um, you know, growing up, I, uh, I've always been a very weak or sick child. Um, sometimes I blame it on being premature. But uh, nonetheless, um, you know, I, I just always had a lot of struggles growing up. Maybe that's why, you know, PK and Pastor Steve are perfectly symptom free and, you know, or almost there. And, you know, they're, they're going about their day. Whereas for me, like day 10, I'm still coughing, feeling aches and pains. You know, I, I think I attribute it to just being, having a bad immune system and just always weak. Um, but also I was weak kind of mentally and emotionally. Um, part of it was because in the fourth grade, I was diagnosed with Tourette syndrome. Now, fourth grade for me was a long time ago for some of you, and uh, it was a long time ago for me. Tourette syndrome and diagnoses was very rare. They're still trying to figure out, but it's pretty clear that I had Tourette syndrome. And with that came a lot of learning disabilities, some struggles that I faced. Now, I didn't really struggle with uh, learning. It was the fact that I kept ticking, and I kept ticking, and I was always anxious. And so can you imagine fourth grade classroom and also just like, you know, shouting out expletives like the F-bomb repeatedly because it was the first time I saw it on TV and I just kept shouting it and everyone's like, <laughs> you know, eventually the teacher took me outside of the classroom, you know, had to learn on my own slowly and the teachers were very caring, but taking my tests by myself outside of the classroom, you know, all of those things, you know, and, and so it was, it was a struggle. Um, but I remember something very important, uh, a lesson uh, from my mom. Now, my mom. My dad was born here in the States. My mom was born in Taiwan. She grew up in Taiwan, went to college in Taiwan, went to a really good prestigious university in Taiwan. And I don't know if any of you are from Taiwan or know people or have parents from Taiwan. They love their academics, do they not? Identity and academics linked together. You know, number one, you know, we must go. And she accomplished uh, many great things. And then she came to the States, got her master's degree. Uh, you know, became an accountant and she was really successful. Um, and then here she had a, a child, the number one son, who uh, just couldn't, couldn't really learn, keep up with the rest of them. And I remember her pulling me aside and she said, you know what, Chris? I want you to remember this thing. I love you no matter what, but I want you to know that regardless of what's going on right now in your life, I want you to never give up. Keep on going. Never give up. She'd say things like, I don't even care if you get a C, as long as you give everything you have into that C. Other people may study one hour and just casually take a test and get an A. You may need to put in four hours with tutors, people constantly pouring into you, nonstop studying, flashcards. Sit, I remember sitting in the car doing timetables with my mom on the way to school, not devos, timetables, okay? Just to get a C. You may have to put in all that work just to get a C. But you know what? Don't you dare compare yourself to everyone else. You put in the work. Never give up, especially if you know it's worth it. Especially if you know it's worth it. And you know, that, that lesson has stuck with me for a very, very long time. This idea of never give up, keep persisting, no matter the trials that come. And I have a, a little, something very precious to me. It's this guitar right here. <clears throat> it's old. I don't play it anymore, unless I feel nostalgic. It's dusty, it's dirty, banged up. But this was the first guitar that I ever got. My parents never got me. Some people have asked me, you know, Chris, how do I get to play what you play? How, how do I get to be your level? And I tell them, 21 years of practice. 21 years of practice is when I first started playing guitar. I'm not Alan Iverson. Practice. I had to practice. I don't compare myself to Alan Iverson. I don't think I ever can. But uh, the guitar. 21 years and I'm still practicing to this day. This guitar has marks because I threw this guitar across the room multiple times in frustration. The strings I barely changed, they're still pretty rusty. The fretboard has blood marks still on it from when I first started playing. Blood, sweat, and tears put into this guitar. 
And I'm reminded of that lesson. It's in my office. I have many guitars. Some I've sold, some I've traded. This one will never go away. Why? Because it reminds me to never give up. That through many trials will come success. To keep on going, especially if you know it is worth it. Especially if you know it's worth it. And you know, for, for some of us, I think if not all of us, if we know our why, if we know that something is valuable, will you not go anywhere, do anything, take on any burden if you know it's valuable? Your children, ah, can't do it. No, you're going to take whatever it takes to care for your child, right? You're going to do whatever it takes if you know that it's valuable. If you know your why, you can endure many things if you know your why. And in the same way today in our passage, we see this in the life of Paul and Barnabas in Acts 14. And my hope is as we dive into our text this morning, that you come away with this one thing, this one point. Can we get to the next slide, please? And it says this, we are to never give up on our calling. Next slide, please. We are to never give up on our calling to make disciples of all nations, regardless of the trials that come, because it is worth it. Never give up on our calling to make disciples. And if you go, ah, Chris, I don't really value making disciples. Well, you should, because God has called you to do it. It is valuable. Make disciples of all nations, regardless of the trials that come, because it is worth it. So as we dive into the passage today, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm not going to read the whole interactions that Paul and Barnabas had with uh, the people here in Acts 14. But I, I have a key passage that I'll read out loud, and then I'll dive into the entire text. And the passage comes from Acts 14, 21 to 22. Acts 14, 21 to 22. If you have your Bibles, please open that up. And I also have a slide for you to take a look. Acts 14, 21 to 22. And it says this. When they had preached, as in Paul and Barnabas, preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. I love that last line. Huh? Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. The word of the Lord. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father God, I thank you for this day. I thank you that your word is being preached today. I ask that you use me to communicate a message, to spur them on, to live a life, to never give up, and to continually make disciples and see that it is valuable. I thank you so much for this day. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we see in Acts something very profound, Acts 14. Paul and Barnabas will go to any lengths and will endure anything for the sake of the gospel. For the sake of the gospel. And so my question to you is, what are you willing to endure for the sake of your calling? Next slide. What are you willing to endure for the sake of your calling? Acts 14 describes Paul and Barnabas' adventures, sharing the gospel and making disciples in the region called Galatia. The book of Galatians, or the letter to the Galatian church, was not a city, but a region with multiple cities and towns now called modern-day Turkey. And there was treacherous. It was hilly. It wasn't flat. But along with this, kind of this area along all, all these adventures, it was noted by some biblical historians that it was around this time that Paul was diagnosed with what's called malaria fever. Malaria fever. It was a fever so painful that it caused, caused throbbing headaches to the point where his eyes were burning. Now, some of you guys, you know, when you're really, really tired, you get like burnt, you're rubbing your eyes, it kind of hurts, you can barely open it. But his eyes were burning. He could barely open his eyes. And that's why actually at the end of Galatians, it's, Paul says this, see with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. See, when he wrote the book of Galatians and actually many of the letters, he had a scribe join him and he, he, would, or, uh, he would communicate to the scribe what to write. But as a show of love and compassion to the people, he would write with his own hand, the closing. And he would say, see with what large letters I'm writing, writing to you. 150 point font. I 
love you. That's what he would do. Because he couldn't see. Probably a scribe is helping you. Uh, yeah, that's the, that's the wrong, you know, it's the wrong character. Let's erase it, you know. Let's give him another life-size scroll to, to write on. He couldn't see. Paul was not in good shape to go on this trip. His ministry to the region of Galatia started off with a physical challenge, and yet he persisted. <clears throat> he continued to go to the cities and towns of Galatia because he was motivated by his wives. Motivated is by his calling to share the good news of Jesus Christ, to raise up disciples, followers of Jesus, first to the Jews and then the Gentiles. So right off the bat, let me ask you the question again. Would you go if you had malaria fever and throbbing headaches and horrible eyesight? Would you go? I know I wouldn't. I stay home. I need my rest. I'm hurting. <clears throat> or maybe you just wait. I'm going to wait to go until I get better. But what if you don't get better? Would you go? Paul did. And you know what's even crazier? Paul hasn't even left yet, and he's experiencing this. The trials that are about to face him in Acts 14 have not hit him yet. He just started, and many more are to come. So let's dive into our text. Acts 14, 1 to 7 says this. Acts 14, 1 to 7. Now at Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. When an attempt was made on both, uh, when an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derby, cities of Lyconium, and to the surrounding countries. And there they continued to preach the gospel. We see at the beginning Paul and Barnabas sharing the good news of Jesus Christ to the Jews and Greeks in Iconium. But much like the Pharisees did to Jesus, there was this kind of Jewish group of people who did not like the popularity that Paul and Barnabas were getting. <clears throat> Didn't like that popularity. On one level, they thought, this is a cult. This is not appropriate. They're coming into the synagogue and talking about something that didn't fit. It's a cult. But also, people were believing. So it's like their congregants are leaving for another religion. So they were upset. And so what did they do? They stirred up the Gentiles. And they poison their mind. What is this poisoning of the mind? And this is the trial that they face, the trial of the poisoned mind. It's the equivalent of gossip, right? You see, Paul, what, what they were probably doing is telling these, these new converts or people sitting in the audience, did you know that that man, Paul, I heard he used to kill Christians. And now he's preaching about Christ. He's a hypocrite, not worth believing. Stirring it up, poisoning people's minds, not telling the whole truth that Paul converted and God spoke to him, turned his life around. Or another way of looking at it for our modern day is cancel culture. Now, some of it is valid. I get it. Where some of the, the hurt, the betrayal was hidden for years, 20 years came back to life, hoping that the individual would get away with it. And now they're not. I get that. But you know, to be honest, most of cancel culture is an effort to defame an individual that some second party, third party is digging up things about someone else to discredit them. Something 30 years ago, something in their adolescence that they did, not knowing that maybe they're no longer that person anymore and saying, you are that person. That was 30 years ago. I was a child. What did I know? And that's what's going on here. This poisoning of the mind. Can you imagine Paul and Barnabas walking up to a group that they just evangelized to, trying to make disciples of? One night, they were sitting in their home, celebrating, eating, eager to hear the word. And the next night, let's do it again. Oh, uh, no, no, no. Door closed. They come into the synagogue one day, and everyone's like, oh, it's Paul and Barnabas. Let's hear what they had to say. The next day, they, this group is huddled up talking. 
And Paul and Barnabas show up. All right, you guys ready for lesson two? And they just disperse. There was this awkward tension that Paul and Barnabas was feeling with the rest of the people there, the, those that were poisoned in their mind. I'm sure you felt it before. This tension you just can't get rid of between individuals in the church. The poisoned mind was going on there. And so for me, if I, if I experienced that, what would I do if I was in Paul's shoes? I'd leave. Man, I'm sick. My eyes are burning. My eyeballs are about to pop out. And here I am sacrificing for you, offering a message of hope. I don't have to be here. And here you guys are talking behind my back, gossiping about me, ignoring me, one day treating me well, and now no longer caring about who I am. I'm out of here. But what does Paul do in Acts 3? Next slide, please. What does Paul do in Acts 3? He says, so they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord. You know what I expected? So they left. But no, this passage says, so they remained, not for a short time, a long time, speaking boldly for the, probably more boldly than they did before. Amidst this unwelcome tension in the city at Iconium towards Paul and Barnabas, they stayed a long time, long enough to grant signs and wonders and healings to be done as evidence of the validity of the gospel. This is important about miracles. Miracles were not done to Christians who already believed. Miracles were done to those who did not believe to show the evidence and proof of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Just to give you some context. That's what they were doing. To show the power of the God and of Jesus Christ living within them through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're reading on in verses four to seven, it says then that with, uh, there was an attempt on Paul and Barnabas's life and they just fled, right? There's an attempt on his life and they fled. So you go, uh, Chris, I thought your passage or, or your message is never give up. And at the first sign of a threat against their life, they just bolt and leave. How's that not giving up? Didn't they give up? We have to realize this happens after the staying for a long time. I'm going to address this a little bit later in our text, but perhaps God was actually communicating to them saying, you know what, Paul and Barnabas, your time is up at this city. The rest of Galatia has not heard the good news. You got to move on. You have to move on and preach the good news everywhere else. Your job here is done in the city, but your job is not done everywhere else. It's time to go. I get that feeling. The former church that I came from, five years raising up the church, spending time, countless hours, counseling sessions. Don't worry, I, I like those. But, but I never get to see their fruit. I imagine Paul and Barnabas wanted to see their fruit. They enjoyed the community. They loved the fellowship. And yet God was saying, it's time to go. It's time to go. Your job is done. You made disciples here. But there are so many people who have not heard the good news and are not disciples yet. It's time to move on. And so with that, as we get into verse, the next section, 8 to 18, we see Paul moving on to the next town. But he struggles with something very interesting. He struggles with this, the trial of being misunderstood and self-glory. The trial of being misunderstood and self-glory. Now, Paul and Barnabas, once again, they enter the city of Lystra. Now, this city is about 90 miles south, but it's uphill, and they walk by foot. And he's already hurting with malaria fever and eyeballs burning. But he goes. And as they're preaching the gospel in this city or in this town, there's a crippled man listening. And Paul notices this man, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is repentant. He's believing. So what does Paul do? He looks at him sternly and goes, get up. Walk, just like Jesus would have to the lame, to the blind, he would say, see, but to the cripple, get up and walk. And so he does that. And this man gets up and walks. And you know what the people in Lystra do? What do they do? They worship, not God. They worship Paul and Barnabas. They worship Paul and Barnabas. Take a look at verses 11 to 12. Next slide. 11 to 12, it says this. The people said, 
The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas, they called Zeus. And Paul, they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And then the people of Lystra, because of their blindness and misunderstanding, brought so many gifts, animal sacrifices, making the town of Lystra more welcoming for them. Oh, the gods are here. Let's make it nice for them. Let's welcome them. Let's feed them cows, sheep, the best of things. And when Paul and Barnabas realize what, what's going on in verses 15 to 18, they say this, why are you doing these things? They rip their clothes. Why are you doing these things? We're also just men like you. And we bring you good news that you should turn from these, whatever you're doing to us right now, these vain things, we're asking you to turn from that to a living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that it is in it. In the past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness for he did not, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. You see right here, Paul is challenging their Greek God. He's saying, no, there is only one God who has given you all these, not many. And you'd think, okay, these people finally got it. No, not 18. Even with these words, the people scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice. So they, no, take this, take this. And so with this story, I think there were two trials. Like I said, the first one is the blindness of people and their misunderstanding of the message of Jesus Christ. Isn't it so frustrating that sometimes when you try to evangelize and make disciples, they just don't get it in its entirety? It's so frustrating, the, the amount of effort you have to put in. Let me tell you, making disciples is hard work. Hard work. Paul had to stay a long time. Who knows how long, but he had to stay a long time just to get people to understand the good news of Jesus Christ. I'm thinking uh, a good example is, is my relatives who are non-Christian. Maybe you guys can relate. Now, my relatives know that I'm a pastor. I'm married to my wife, and we, we are all Christian. My immediate family are all Christian. My sister is married to a pastor. And upon our, our family gatherings, they always ask us to pray. It used to be my dad, but now I have the honor as the number one son to pray. And he's the pastor. Woo! You know, I remember growing up, there used to be cussing. Now there's no cussing. It's very strange. Um, but anyways, um, it, not, not, not me. I, I didn't do that, but the family gatherings. Okay. Uh, so, so that was going on. And um, in, in my time spending with them, we've always tried to share the good news with them. And you know what their response was? It was never hostile. It was always, yes, thank you for sharing. We believe, along with ancestral worship, along with spirit worship, along with everything else, we believe all of them. Why? We just don't want to get it wrong. We'll believe them all. Oh, so frustrating, you know? That's the hardest thing to counter. John 14, 6, they just don't understand this part. John 14, 6. That Jesus is the only way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, Jesus. They don't get it. It can be frustrating. And then the second temptation. The temptation of self-glory. The second trial of self-glory. When praise and accolades come your way for doing something good on behalf of God, it can be tempting to take credit, can it not? To receive the gifts and worship from people for what you've done. Not once giving God the glory and taking it for yourself instead. Now I'm going to embarrass myself. Can I get that? The next slide. There's a picture of myself. Oh boy. <clears throat> that was a time when I was uh, touring with a band, a rock band called CTI Music Ministries. It was a Christian rock band. We toured all over the world playing concerts. And I'll be honest, the temptation for fame and glory and praise from the crowds was extremely intimidating. Oftentimes, the people didn't see God, but saw us as a American rock band, but not a Christian rock band. Sometimes they would come up to us and ask for autographs and pictures as if we're some type of celebrity, not knowing that we're doing covers. You know, like, is this your own song? Can you sign it? You know, here's my T-shirt, sign it and all that stuff. Man, it was so tempting for all that fame. And if you look at this picture, as embarrassing as this is, um, I probably fell into that trap during that time. I love that fame and glory. I mean, look at me. Oh, goodness. 
I had a mohawk, if you couldn't tell. The legit mohawk. I, I actually missed the mohawk. My wife won't let me bring it back. But I had the white sunglasses on the back. The guitar. Look at that face. Oh, my goodness. I, I bet you. I don't even remember what song, but I bet you it was like, I love you, Lord, or something. Yeah. Selling it. I definitely fell into that trap. And to be honest, maybe it's still a challenge for me to want praise and glory for myself rather than tear my clothes. You know, if you say, oh, Chris, that was an awesome message. Great. I loved it. I love the way you speak. Can you imagine? No! <laughs> oh, yeah, rip my clothes. You know, please. <laughs> but, you know, and, and, and joking aside, it is God and God alone that should be praised and thanked. And that was what was, that's what Paul was doing in this moment. It's God and God alone. And finally, we see in verses 19 to 23, we see this final trial. And, and let's get, yeah, let's move on to the next slide. That was too embarrassing. The next trial, the final trial is this. And I called it, till death do we part from our calling. See, after the misunderstanding of the people in Lystra and giving, um, and giving all the praise to Paul and Barnabas, uh, these pesky Jews that were in Iconium followed Paul and Barnabas to Lystra because they were still jealous. And now this whole city were worshiping Paul and Barnabas. And what do these Jews do? They're jealous. And so they stir up the people again, against Paul and Barnabas, against their, their message. And this time they were successful in stoning Paul. They were successful in stirring up the crowd so much that the crowds picked up stones and threw it at Paul. Now, these weren't just little puny pebbles. My daughter likes the pebbles in our backyard. She grabs them and just kind of chucks them a little bit. No, these were ginormous softball-sized rocks, man-sized rocks that they were just picking up and just chucking it at Paul. Now, imagine this kind of stoning actually was very popular because it was always successful in executing someone who they just didn't like, causing disruption in the town or city. So just imagine you. Crowds of people. Look around. How many people are here? They're all surrounding you, pushing you, spitting on you, calling you names, vulgar names, lies about who you are. And you can't actually see who's doing it. Maybe it was a close friend that you were evangelizing to, the person that you just ate with the night before. Now pushing you, spitting on you. Not really seeing, it was all blurry, being pushed side to side, back and forth. And next thing you know, a rock shatters on your face, blood dripping down. Another one comes, another one comes until you fall to the ground. And more are still being thrown. Feet now are hitting your face and your abdomen. It was a popular executionary method. And Paul should have died. As a matter of fact, it was so successful that they kept throwing until they knew he was dead. There were signs to show yeah, that person's dead. And that's what happened to Paul. He fell down, left for dead, looked like he was dead. And then in verse 20, it says this, but when the disciples gathered around him, next slide, when the disciples gathered around him, they were probably thinking, okay, let's, Let's pick up Paul now. Let's bury him. But that's actually not what happened. Paul lying there, the disciples around him kind of staring at him like, oh, man. He pops up. Boom. And instead of, oh, oh I'm in pain. Where's my ibuprofen? I need that IV stat. You know, where's the gauze put me together? Bring me back to home base. I need some water. I need some food. Help me recuperate. What does he do? He goes straight back into the city. He goes straight back into the city. Bloody and bruised, limping, dragging his leg. Blood all over his face. Not only is it blurry vision, now he got blurry red vision probably. It's all the blood. And he goes and preaches the good news. See, this goes back to my first point. Remember, when an attempt was made on his life, he fled. Why? Well, because his job was done there in Iconium. But here in Lystra, he should have died. A successful attempt was made on his life, but he didn't flee. He went back in. Why? The job wasn't done. 
Evangelism was not done. Disciples were not made yet. He went back in to finish the job. He went back in to finish the job. And this leads me to the key verse that we read this morning, 21 to 22, and it says this. After he was done making disciples and he continues on, he encourages the people and says this. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned. They went back to the cities that they evangelized to, Lystra and to Iconium, the place that he fled from, and to Antioch, which is his home base, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith. He doesn't complain about how unwelcoming they were and the stones that were thrown. He encourages the church to keep on going. And he says this, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Through many trials, we must enter the kingdom of God. What did Paul value most? The kingdom of God. He longed for the day to be in the presence of God, to be in the kingdom of God. He longed it and he valued it so much that he wanted everyone else to know about the kingdom of God. It was worth it. All the trials that he faced, he faced it because he knew the kingdom of God was worth it. You see, trials are inevitable in the Christian walk and calling. All of trials in your life are a means to encourage others to remain faithful, are they not? That's why Paul can say in Romans 5, 3 to 5, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. That's why trials come, to build us up, to eventually have hope, to value the kingdom of God. So often we operate in fear right? Fear of suffering, pain, trials, challenges that come our way. So much so that we're like Jonah. When God calls us to make disciples here and right now, we choose to not do that, but instead make plans and even spend money to avoid that. But God has a way of calling us back to what we're supposed to be doing, does he not? Fellow Christians, what are we teaching our new believers, our children? Our future generations, if all we do is make plans and live a life out of fear, of pain and suffering, rather than face it head on, fully submitting to the will of God to protect us. That's what genuine faith in Jesus Christ looks like. To not fear the world and the trials that come, but to go into the fire, to never give up, to finish the job here and now. How many of you have ever asked, what is actually my job, not in life, but here right now. Let me tell you, it's to make disciples. So you got to figure out who. To go and to make disciples. This is what genuine faith looks like. And you know who's holding your life? God. You know what else? The only reason why all of you are here today, have breath, is because God's purpose for you is not complete. Your job is not done yet. Did you, did you think about that? The reason why you're alive today is because your job is not done. You have a job to do. I think of the movie Hacksaw Ridge. Anyone ever seen this movie before? It's a great movie. I love war movies. But anyways, Hacksaw Ridge, there, there's a man named Desmond Doss, main character. He's a medic in World War II. And he goes to Japan. Now, uh, because of religious convictions, he refuses to carry a weapon. Who goes to battle without a weapon? He does. He's a medic. No weapon. And he goes into Japan the war and he's in this battle hacksaw ridge and bullets are flying bombs exploding and he has no weapon and he's trying to figure out what to do as a medic so he's going people are crying for help and he's trying to bandage them up and heal uh, you know and, and get them uh, okay and stable and he moves on to the next person the only problem is another bullet would come and shoot that person that he just tried to fix and so he tries to think of something uh, even better and so what does he do he bandages them up and he carries them to safety so that the bullets won't kill them. And that's his job. That's what he does. He just keeps on going until this famous scene where one of his closest friends, who during boot camp was actually his enemy and rival, he tries to, to patch him up and drags him. And right when he gets him to safety, he looks and his friend is dead. 
in anger, he looks up at God in the sky and says, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And it pans back to the battle, bullets flying, explosions, and it's dark. And there's a voice in the distance, somebody help. Bullets flying, fire everywhere. Somebody help. And Desmond Doss looks up at the sky and says, Lord, help me get one more. And he goes back in to save many, many more lives. And not just allies, but even Japanese soldiers. Lord, help me get one more. May our cry in this life, no matter the pain, no matter the trials, no matter the suffering, till death do we part from it, may our battle cry be, Lord, help me get one more. Help me get one more. To close this, this service, I have a song, a worship song that I'll sing for you. My prayer and hope is that it's an anthem for all of you. To say to yourself, Lord, no matter the cost, help me get one more. Bear with me, I still have some lingering cough from COVID. This time of desperation When all we know is doubt and fear There is only one foundation This broken generation When all is dark you help us There is only one salvation We believe We believe We believe in God the Father We believe Christ, we believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us in life. We believe in the crucifixion, we believe that He conquered death. Let our faith be born in anthems Greater than songs we sing And in our weakness and temptations We believe We believe We believe in God Our God will see, we believe, we believe. And the gates of hell are not prevent for the power of God has torn the veil. Now we know your love will never fail. We believe, we believe. Let this 
heart spur you on. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit. And He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that He conquered death. Sing, we believe in God the Father. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit. And He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that He conquered death. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you so much for this day that we get to hear your message. God, I ask that this message wouldn't just simply be an anthem, the song wouldn't just simply be an anthem, but that we would actually live this message out. God, may we never give up on our calling to make disciples of all nations. May we value the kingdom of God so much that we want the world to know. And so God, Lord, Help us get one more. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Pastor Chris. What an encouraging and exhorting uh, lesson this morning. Um, Jeff opened us up this morning from Matthew, where he said, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered. Then he, then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field, right? Why do we go through this? Why the endurance? Because the kingdom of heaven is worth it. And that's our exhortation today. Our lives here on this earth are so short. I was asking my youngest, what do you want to be when you grow up? And if you've asked your, your young generation, they all want to be YouTubers and they want followers, right? And you look at the language of the world today. If you're not making disciples of Christ, the world is making disciples of you, right? Wherever you are. I have a few announcements. Uh, welcome to Fellowship Bible Church. We're so glad that you're here. If you're new, please take some time, meet Pastor Chris, meet some of the elders. We welcome you. We're excited that you're here. We're in the middle of summer. We're just getting over the hump. Summer is definitely some of our most um, enduring times here at Fellowship Bible Church. We just finished uh, day camp, our junior high uh, summer camp as well, but we're not done. Uh, we wanted to announce that we're going through a women's series and we're going through that through August. There's still time to join on Wednesday evenings. If you're interested, please reach out to Kayla, reach out to Daisy. We'd love to have you. Is this forwarding? Okay, great. Um, CBM camp, again, we just finished our junior high camp, a blessed week. Uh, challenging, enduring, hot weather. Uh, senior high camp is coming up this week. A couple of announcements. Please be in prayer for all of the staff, for our directors, the counselors. There's some who are doing two weeks, iron women and men who are going up there again. Please be with them. The camp bus is arriving here at FBC. So this is for the campers. Please be here no earlier than 930. Uh, we load up and then the bus departs uh, 10 a.m. The bus will be here. Um, the theme of CBM camp is mission possible, a focus again on making disciples, going out and reaching the world. And our missionary this week are the Curtises. They've been uh, missionaries in Utah for several decades and Fellowship Bible Church has been supporting them for just as long. Uh, they've raised generations and different churches in Utah uh, they've come on a number of different missions conferences. Please be in prayer for the Curtises this week. As we transition into August, uh, next week we have our monthly first week meal. 
If you haven't signed up yet, please do so. We love bringing everybody together after second service for lunch and just to get us all back together after a very long bout of being virtual. Um, with that, so far we've been catering all of our meals, but we're gonna transition to start using the wonderful kitchen that God has provided. And uh, Emily and Grace have been organizing all these meals and they're asking for, if you love to cook, if you love to eat, mostly, um, come join the team. They're gonna put lunches together uh, every first Sunday. Um, going along the theme of eating, we have our annual church picnic. If you haven't signed up yet, this is coming up in two weeks. Please sign up. We need to get an accurate count to make sure we have enough food. There's a QR code up there. There's, they're posted on the doors. Scan and sign up. We uh, collect all the names just so we make sure we have enough. And then the following Sunday after our Thanksgiving picnic on the 14th is Baptism Sunday. We're holding kind of an impromptu baptism because we have a lot of kids coming back from camp. Uh, some who couldn't uh, attend the earlier baptism, we already have two signed up. If you're interested in being baptized, please let Pastor Kevin know, let me know, let Pastor Chris know, and we'll get you on the list, okay? And then uh, the Cantonese Fellowship, a wonderful fellowship, uh, meets every uh, second and fourth Sunday, and then their next meeting is going to be August 14th at 2.30, and they meet downstairs in the CTF Fellowship Hall. Please join if uh, you're interested in a, a solid study in Cantonese, a wonderful group that meets uh, every other second and fourth Sundays. Um, our website is an important means by which we reach out to the community. A lot of people actually come to know about Fellowship Bible Church through the website. We want to modernize, update some of the photos, and we're looking for some volunteers uh, to come and take some photos uh, just to update that. Lunch will be provided, but if you're interested, please let Megan Khan know. There's actually a sign-up form that we'd like you to sign up on. And then uh, last but not least, we continue to uh, encourage online giving. We do have giving in the back in the, uh, in the foyer, uh, but online giving has uh, been kind of the dominant way that we're uh, taking up our offering. We're so thankful for the church family who continues to give. Uh, and as being part of the board, we are very cognitive of how we invest that into the church family. So uh, online giving is uh, encouraged. And then uh, last but not least, Crown uh, Ministries is uh, promoting a golf tournament in September. This is really a great way for you to get family, friends, coworkers out, uh, playing golf, uh, spending the day together, hearing the gospel. So if you're interested, please reach out to Brad Wong, get signed up um, uh, in September. And then uh, I just want to thank you, everybody. Uh, we're going to pray, uh, and then you'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you for this morning. Father, we're grateful for your word. We're grateful that you established Sundays as a time that we can come and worship together and be encouraged and to be reminded of our calling uh, by you. And Father, we're here because you have given us life and breath, and you desire for us to use the gifts you've given us. Uh, the gospel that you've given us, the good news to bring others to you. And there's no more important purpose for us than to bring others to know you, to make disciples. And Father, strengthen us, make us courageous, help us to find that focus once again. We thank you for this morning, and we thank you for this time. In your son's name, amen. Thank you, everybody. You're dismissed.